Hey everyone, I'm Brandon Robbins, and this week we're going to talk about why people hate Christians and why people love it when the church fails. Now before we get started, if you haven't had a chance yet, make sure to go down and click that subscribe button below and then click that little bell next to it so you get notifications each week when we put out new videos. Every week we're putting out new videos to help you grow in your faith and to give you ideas for how your church can grow too. One of the things that I've noticed over the past few months is that the videos that seem to get the most hits, that seem to have the most interest, are the ones that talk about the church failing. For some reason, people just seem really interested in how the church is crumbling and how things are falling apart. And it got me wondering, what is it about the church's demise that sparks so much interest for people? Why is it that people want to hear about the church failing? I think it's no surprise that our culture feels a lot of animosity towards the church. And the question I want to wrestle with today is, why is that? And is there anything we can do about it? So here are a few reasons why people love to hate Christians and love to see the church fail. The first reason is that there are a lot of people out there who've been hurt by the church. Over the past decade or so, there have been many stories that have come out about sexual abuse in the church. These days, questions about LGBTQ inclusion show that there are many people who've been shunned and rejected by the church. Unfortunately, many churches have a reputation for proclaiming the gospel, but not necessarily upholding it. For talking about the love of Jesus, but not necessarily showing it. And that's caused many people to be hurt by the church, which in many cases can lead to resentment and a desire to see that church fail. The second cause of this hatred is judgmental Christians. Maybe a person hasn't had a bad experience with the church as a whole, but within that congregation, within that church, they ran into a few judgmental Christians who just made them feel awful about themselves. Maybe it was because they were divorced or because they were living with somebody before they were married. Maybe it was because of how they handled their money, whether they were too rich or too poor. But whatever it was, it seemed like those Christians within that church were willing to overlook their own sins, their own mistakes, so that they could judge somebody else. A lot of times Christians have a reputation for making other people feel bad so that they can feel better about themselves. And when that happens, it just breeds animosity and causes people to have hatred and bad feelings towards Christians. Tied to that, the third reason that many people love to see Christians and churches fail is that it actually removes their own guilt. And what I mean by that is that if Christians have made people feel guilty or if churches have made people feel guilty and those Christians fall or those churches fail, then it removes the source of that guilt, right? It takes away the people, it takes away the cause of that guilt and actually frees people to not have to feel that anymore. The fourth reason is that Jesus himself said that Christians would face resistance. In John's gospel, Jesus says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you don't belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, and that is why the world hates you. Throughout his ministry, people hated Jesus, right? The wealthy hated him, religious leaders hated him, government people hated him, because he was turning the world upside down. He was disrupting their power and the hold they had over society. He was questioning their practices. What's ironic though, is that the people who didn't hate Jesus, the people who loved him, We're the sinners, which seems so opposite from how the church is received today. Finally, the fifth reason that many times people hate Christians and love to see the church fail is that often we will claim certainty without proof. And what I mean by that is that there are many times where Christians will hold fast to an interpretation of Scripture even if it's proven wrong. Or they'll claim they hear the voice of God even if that's proven not to be true. There are even times where Christians won't admit that they don't have all the answers, which frustrates people. And what it causes is for us to lose credibility in the eyes of society and to lose that sacred trust that we really desire to hold in people's lives. So now the question is, what do we do about it? How do we change this? How do we change our perception within society and make it so that people don't hate Christians or desire to see Christians fail, but instead see the beauty of what God has called us to do and who God has called us to be? Well, one thing I think is really important for us to do is to repent. We need to apologize for the mistakes we've made in the past. We need to apologize for being stubborn and for hurting people. There's this really powerful story that Donald Miller tells in the book, Blue Like Jazz, where he talks about how they were on a college campus one time and they set up a confession booth in the midst of this big festival going on on campus. 
But instead of receiving confessions from people who were drinking and smoking and doing all sorts of things that Christians would consider sinful, they offered confessions. When people sat in their booth, they looked them in the eyes and they said, hey, we're sorry for the way that the church has hurt you. We're sorry for the way that the church has made mistakes in the past. We're sorry for the reputation that we've created for ourselves. And we seek your forgiveness. We repent to you. Can you imagine how the world would respond if the church began to do that? If we began to truly just come together and apologize for our mistakes, repent of our sins against society, against people, against the people that God had entrusted into our care over the years. What might people think if we looked them in the eyes and said, I'm sorry, and we are really going to try to be better. So if you really want to begin to change the way that people see the church and the way that people see Christians, one of the things you can do is repent. Repent for yourself. Repent for the church. Repent for other Christians. Help people to know that this is not who we are. This is not who we were called to be. And this is not who we seek to be in the future. Another thing that we can do is really study the greats. And what I mean by that is the great commandment, the great commission, and what's been called the great compassion. Every one of Jesus' teachings is critical. But there are three that I think could have a really big impact on the relationship between Christians and the world around them. The first is called the great commandment. And this is where people came up to Jesus one day and asked Jesus, of all the commandments out there, which is the most important? And Jesus responded by saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. What Jesus was saying is that if we live out these two things, if we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we love our neighbor as ourself, in doing these two things, we will be fulfilling all the other commandments. We will be living as God has called us to live. The second is called the Great Commission. And this is where Jesus is about to leave and ascend into heaven. And his last commission, his last teaching, his last command to his disciples is this. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that our mission as the church is to go out and teach people what Jesus taught us. To teach them to live as he lived and be who he was. Just as Jesus raised up disciples to be his continuous presence in the world, that's our mission, to continue to grow and make disciples who are the presence of Christ in this world. And here's why this is so important. Because if we're out there making disciples like Jesus made disciples, then we're not forcing people to become Christians through judgment and guilt. Instead, we are loving people with grace and compassion in the midst of their sin and helping to heal their brokenness by offering them the salvation that only Jesus can offer them. I mean, if we're really making disciples like Jesus made disciples, then that changes the way that we approach things. It changes a lot of times what it means for us to be Christian. It changes the practices of the church. And hopefully it sets us on a path of undoing so many of the mistakes that we've made over the years. Finally, the last teaching is what has been called the great compassion. And let me read it for you. Jesus is telling a parable and he says, For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it, for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you were doing it for me. What Jesus is saying is that whenever we help people who are hurting, the poor, the sick, the hungry, the broken, it's as if we're doing it for him. And just imagine how things would change for Christians if we began to let that be our focus. To be loving the least of these. To be helping those who are hurting. Instead of arguing about things, instead of making people feel rejected by the church or too low for what's going on in their lives, what if we were really treating everybody we saw as if that was Jesus? And so in order for things to change, we need to study these great teachings. So ask yourself, what would your life look like if you were living out the great commandment, the great commission, the great compassion? What would you need to start doing? What would you need to stop doing? What would you need to continue doing? What would change in your life? if these were really central to how you lived. Finally, the third thing that we can do to change the way that people see Christians and to change the reputation of the church in the world is something so simple and yet so critical. And that's that we just really need to start focusing on helping people. 
Now, I know churches all over the place are helping people every single day. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of the culture around us, that is not what Christians are known for. Because here's the thing, without this, the church has no credibility. I mean, think about it. Think about what do most people think of when they think of Jesus? They think of his miracles. They think of his healings, right? With the exception of the Gospel of John, most of the Gospels tell just as much, if not more, about Jesus' actions as they do his teachings. And think about this from an even bigger perspective, right? God came to earth and became a human. God could have gone anywhere and done anything, but God chose to be a poor man who helped hurting people. And God gave this promise through Jesus that we can have salvation, not just sometime later when we die, but right here, right now, on this earth. But when the church doesn't reflect this, when this isn't one of the top two things that people think of when they think of Christians, when this isn't one of the top two things that we are doing, then Christians begin to look nothing like their Christ. And someone who truly appreciates Jesus feels no guilt in watching Christians fall. I mean, I'll be honest, there are times where I don't know what to do with the name Christian. Right? It's who we are. It connects us to our Savior. There are times where it feels like we've just dragged this name through the mud. And it doesn't mean the same thing that it should. I mean, how sad is it that we might be the ones preventing people from knowing the love of Jesus because we just don't look like him. We can't let that happen. And so in the comment section below, I'd love to hear your thoughts about other things you think that Christians can do to really look more like their Christ. Right? What are things that Christians in the church can do to change the way the world around them sees them? What are things that we can do to alter the reputation that we've gained over the years? And while you're down there, please take a moment to click that thumbs up to like this video. And if you haven't done so already, click that subscribe button so you get these videos each and every week. That's it for this week. We'll see you next time.